We've been talking over the past few months with a large number of key and emerging players in the UK's energy storage industry. Just ahead of our show, Solar Energy UK, which takes place next week from the 13th to the 15th of October, we thought this would be a good opportunity to share with you the thoughts of two of those players on the relationship between renewables and energy storage. Both come from different angles, but I think you'll find what they have to say really interesting. Smart power systems analyse, design and commission electrical power systems, working with both public networks overseen by DNOs and private networks for commercial and industrial users. The company's chief, Dr Ian Chilvers, spoke to us about the relationship between the network, renewables and energy storage. In, in the UK, we've probably, as in any, any country in, in Europe, we've got a, a finite capacity of electricity network uh, uh, infrastructure for, for, for which we can connect uh, renewables, renewable energy. And in many parts of uh, the UK, we're, we're fast approaching those limits. So as we approach those limits, we, we hit a lot of the, uh, the grid network constraints, okay, such as uh, thermal overloading of, of overhead lines, uh, uh, fault levels, increasing fault levels, increasing voltages. Uh, so the, what, what these grid constraints tend to do is, 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 is limit, as I said, limits the amount of renewable energy capacity we can install. So one of the uh, uh, objectives we're pursuing is, is the use of storage working with renewables to allow some of these network constraints to be overcome and allowing the developer to increase the installed capacity of his renewables. But what that can also do uh, as an advantage to the DNO is that the DNO may not need to upgrade a certain 132 kV line or, or change a transformer. It, it, can, it can reduce the costs uh, of upgrading their network and the time and engineering man hours that they require to do that. So in terms of getting that storage deployed in the most effective way and at the right scales, um, yeah, I mean, what are some of the what are some of the, the ways forward that, that you would advocate for, or that you know you might have found in the course of your work? Well, we're, we're, what we're pushing at the moment is uh, we do a lot of work for private private clients, uh, such as uh, hospitals, uh, business parks, uh, industrial processes, uh, which are you know seriously looking at the installation of renewable energy, uh, primarily uh, PV, and they're coming up against. Uh, grid constraints which uh, effectively make their renewable energy uh, cost prohibitive. So with the use of storage there is a, there is a way to sort of uh, re reduce grid connection costs whilst using the, the generated PV energy more uh, ideally on, on their site. So for example we're looking at a couple of networks where the, uh, the, the client is interested in using the PV energy uh, generated in the daytime in an evening because they've got a 24-7 uh, process. Uh, but they've also got grid constraints, meaning that they're limited to how much they can export to the grid. So it actually suits them to use that PV energy in the night time as well to get grid connection costs down. So there's, there's, lots, of, there's lots of factors going on here which can uh, enhance the business case for storage on private electricity networks. So. Could you just talk us through some of the advantages of deploying behind the meter um, electricity storage onto these private networks? I mean, if you could just explain briefly the distinction between a private network and how it sits onto the national network. Okay, so the you know the, the, the DNO, the distribution network operators, look after 132 kV networks and below in the UK. Uh, private electricity networks are connected uh, to the public electricity networks and, and the DNO will manage the point of connection of the private electricity network to the public electricity network. Now, electrical current and, and, and voltage is, 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 doesn't discriminate whether it's uh, a private or a public electricity network. So connecting behind the meter uh, would be totally uh, controlled by the uh, uh, private network owner. Obviously the private network owner must make sure that they comply with DNO uh, engineering recommendations and standards and statutory legislation. But they're having to do that with 
uh, photovoltaics and other renewable energy anyway. So it's only an extension of that process. So we, we've, got a, we've got a real market opportunity to look at private electricity networks, solve problems for, for clients such as reducing energy costs, uh, making them more green, reducing carbon, whilst the opportunity arises to work with the DNO during the connection to see what, well, can these systems also play a part in reducing technical constraints on, on the DNO's network, such as voltage issues and, and fault level issues and thermal overloading. So the, you know, a, a close working relationship between the developer and the DNO is very important in the future and uh, perhaps in the past this hasn't been common and, and it's something that at Smart Power Systems we concentrate very, very, very closely on and, and work closely with a number of DNOs. So do you think that with uh, storage we can uh, help the DNOs to love solar on their networks? I, 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 th I think uh, that there's a distinct possibility of that happening. Uh, you know, we, we, still, we, we still welcome uh, uh, a, a change in, in current electricity regulations uh, where, where the DNOs are actually in a better position to, to come f for help and technical support from renewable energy and distributed generation developers. That, that, and, and the work that's being doing lobbying the government and DEC for, on behalf of energy storage will help that cause. Meanwhile, Cumulus Energy Storage is a manufacturer of its own proprietary battery technology. With offices in the US and a manufacturing facility in Sheffield, the company is seeking to address many of the challenges for both renewables and wider electricity network issues and also has plans to take its UK manufacturing up to gigawatt scale. Nick Kitchen from Cumulus talks to us about the battery, its applications and his views on what energy storage and renewables can achieve together. So what we did was we looked at the needs of the stationary energy storage market and we've, we've, what we've done is we've de-risked our development program and shortened the development program as a consequence of that by taking large-scale industrial processes that are already in existence. We've taken the mining industry which has got a two-stage process for extracting the metals. Mm -hmm. You leach the metal out of the ore and then you refine it through a second process called electro-winning where you literally plate non-ferrous metals onto the electrodes. So this electro-winning process, we, we then took that and said how can we turn that into a rechargeable battery. Mm. Well 200 years ago Volta invented the copper zinc battery which was a disc of copper, disc of zinc, a bit of cardboard and some brine and that was a single use battery. He didn't have a membrane or a, a battery separator at that point in time, they weren't available. What we've done is we've taken a battery separator from another industry and we've taken that, we've put that in between the copper and the zinc discs and providing the copper and the zinc don't go through the membrane, you can keep charging and discharging the battery as many times as you like. In other words, we've created a rechargeable copper zinc battery. So this, um, the process presumably, I mean, the aim of it is to make batteries as cost competitive as possible. Yes, we, we, we recognize that most of the battery developments are in, the, in the recent history has been driven by the automotive market and mobiles, laptops, those things. So lighter, higher energy density um, has been the key thing. And, and the chemistries to achieve that are unfortunately very expensive. So lithium ion is a, is, a, is a key one, for example. So by looking at the chemistries out there where we can genuinely get abundant materials that deliver a low cost solution with a long life that just sits there and does its job um, at ambient temperature, that's, that the low bulk density is not an issue because it's stationary, we can, we can deliver that with a copper zinc chemistry. So that's, that's that the principal reason why we've gone for that, backed up, as I say, with the mining industry, large scale downsizing that rather than trying to upscale as, as a key part of our strategy. So, that, so just going back to the original question, the link with electro winning is every time you charge the battery, you're effectively electro winning zinc onto the zinc electrode, and every time you discharge the battery, you're electro winning copper onto the copper electrode. So it, that's, the, that's the link with the, with the mining process. So it's, it's taking those large scale decades of operation, hundreds of megawatts in terms of size, tried and tested chemistries, and using that to, to create a very, very low cost, um, very, very long life, 30 years, um, copper zinc battery. Okay. 
And I mean, at the moment, it's looking to become, you know, even with the best battery chemistries, it's looking to become a very competitive space, I guess. Um, the key metric for us to be thinking of for the big bulk time shift market is the levelized cost of energy, in other words the cost of the battery over the, over the lifetime of that battery. And when we look at the levelized cost of energy, we've used the um, US Department of Energy EPRI model and we've compared ourselves, our technology against the other technologies in that uh, energy storage space. And our, our levelized cost of energy is about the same as the levelized cost of energy of the pumped hydro, which right now is about 96% of the global energy storage market. All the other battery technologies and all the other alternative technologies are all significantly more expensive than we are. I think we were talking before at the Solar Media Roundtable about a month or so ago, and, and you were kind of talking through what, you know, what might be called Cumulus's strategy for, for adopting almost like a several levels of approach starting with sort of low-hanging fruit um, again do you think that's something that you could maybe elaborate on for our readers who yeah, very, very obviously happy. weren't at the round table yes very, very happy to do that essentially there are we see three key markets uh, for energy storage uh, for big bulk time shift energy storage one is the uh, behind the meter electricity intensive industries so those hundred thousand companies in the UK for example that that as part of their negotiations for electricity prices, they take the risk of um, operating at times of the triad periods, those three half hours in the year when you've got the maximum electricity demand for, for the grid. Uh, if you get caught operating in those three half hour periods, the, the price of the electricity is very expensive. So it's effectively a demand charge um, to use the US and, and European te terminology. So if we can offer uh, better ways to manage the, those companies' energy consumption, reduce their cost, improve their overall efficiency, then that's a, that's a major plus. So that's behind the meter, electricity intensive industries. That's one key market for us right now. Second key market is the, um, the generation, so renewables generation at commercial scale, so typically one megawatt plus, whether that's wind or solar, that again behind the meter, relatively easy to do a value proposition, that's one market, the th second market for us. Third market, which is very, very foggy at the moment, is the infrastructure. So the, the grid itself, what is the value proposition? Um, difficult, difficult to ascertain at this stage. So it, that will become clear over a period of time, um, clear across Europe, not just the UK, but at the moment that's our third, that's probably the biggest market opportunity long term. But for, for now, we've got plenty to look at in terms of electricity intensive industries and the commercial generation by renewables.